slow down a little, maybe we get yeah. started. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right. So hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alyssa Johnson. I work at the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Uh, Lauren, do you want to say hi? Sure. I'm Lauren Brady. I also work at the Vermont Council on Rural Development on community engagement and policy work here. So thank you, like I said, for all of you for joining. It looks like we have some pretty good representation from really all four corners of the state. So this is um, our first of 2024 workshop for the Vermont Community Leadership Network, or VCLN. And this is a network that we've supported at VCRD actually since COVID. So in 2020, we started a variety of online convenings to really bring folks together from across the state to share best practices and projects happening in different communities and learn from one another. But another big piece of our programming has been Skillshare workshops and recognizing what are those key skills that are really important for community leaders across the state and how can we take some folks who have real relevant expertise and background in these topics and share workshops so that they're available for all of you. Um, so that's what we have today. We're excited to welcome Jenna Lapachinsky from the Preservation Trust of Vermont, who has an incredible presentation on project management. I will say as someone who works at VCRD with community leaders across the state, it feels like project development and project management is just so core and fundamental to really all of the exciting work we see happening across Vermont. It's really about community members coming together and making projects a reality. But as many of you who are involved in this work know, there's a lot to that. It takes a lot of work to actually get a project from an idea across the finish line. So again, Jenna has real deep expertise in what this actually looks like and some best practices to share with you all. Um, you probably heard the announcement when you came in, so we are gonna be recording this. So this will also be a resource to share with friends, partners um, who might not have been able to make it today. Um, and we'll also live on our website. That's also a general resource. So all of those um, Vermont Community Leadership Network workshops from again, across the now four years are also a resource. So you can go back and dig through advice on fundraising, engaging with municipal leadership, again, whatever the different components are. Um, so thank you again, we'll turn it over to Jenna to run the presentation. Um, there is a chat, so we're gonna have ample time for questions. Um, we're gonna run till 11.30 today. The presentation will be in the first hour. So if folks have to hop off at 11, um, that's fine, but we'll try and leave some time for questions throughout the presentation. Um, but with that, I'll turn it over to Jenna. Again, she works for the Preservation Trust of Vermont, very deeply involved in this work day to day. And we're just so grateful to have her here and to share her expertise with all of you. Thanks, Melissa. I'm really excited to be here. Excited to see some familiar faces and names in the chat, but also really excited to get to hear from you all and hear what you're working on. Um, I'm a field service representative for the Preservation Trust of Vermont, and so I do a lot of technical assistance, um, but I also manage our grant programs. And so PTV, we are a statewide nonprofit, and our mission is to build community through the preservation and revitalization of historic buildings, downtowns, and village centers. And so that is the, the lens through which I, I see a lot of project management. And so those are the presentation today kind of talks about a broad overview of kind of project development and project management, but it also highlights areas where I see a lot of communities and community members get stuck and where I myself have gotten stuck in managing these resources. Um, everybody manages their first foundation or federal grant at some point, And so those are always really important learning processes. So I will share my screen and there will be a couple, um, there will be um, some 101 tips and those will be kind of the natural points where we can stop and answer questions that are in the chat bar. And so just bear with me. Um, so you all can see the presentation, but not my notes. Okay, good, that's always the sweet spot. Um, and my contact information will be at the end of the presentation. You can find it on PTV's website. Um, and I'm part of a field service team. And so even if I'm not always the person who may talk to you, I, I'm very much involved with a lot of these community projects. So project management is a lot like planning a good road trip. And I'll kind of reference that throughout this presentation. And that feels a little silly, but it's honestly one of the best analogies I've come up with. Um, you need to have 
a clear destination of where you're heading. And you need to figure out how you want to get there, where you want to stop along the way. You need to figure out who's going to be in your car so it can be a fun road trip because projects, these community projects, they take a long time. They don't happen overnight. And so you really want to have a good mix of people working on this with you and helping you drive this forward. Um, you want to have a pretty good understanding of how much it's going to cost to take your road trip, where you're going to stop, where you're going to stay the night, where you want to eat. Those are all your planning steps throughout the project management process. Um, it's okay if you need to take some detours or have an emergency stop. You just want to like pick up the phone and call the people who you need to let know that these things are happening. Those are your project partners, your funders, your technical assistance providers. Um, and really, you want to have fun. You want to have good music. You want to have good people and like celebrate along the way. And, and I think frequently with community projects, we get kind of tunnel vision of working towards the destination. But you really need to stop and celebrate your successes. And so you need to start with kind of like where you want to go on this road trip. And so that's your visioning and your envisioning process. So frequently, especially with a lot of projects at the Preservation Trust Vermont sees, there's, there's a building that's in a community and you are trying to figure out what the heck you're going to do with it. And so you're thinking about kind of these big picture questions of, of what is the project and what needs to happen to make it a reality. And, you know, kind of the flip side of that is like, what is the challenge and what does solved look like? And frequently, I think we focus a lot on solving a problem in a very particular way, but there are lots of ways to get to solved. And so having kind of an open community conversation, looking at all of the different possibilities and thinking of creative ways to kind of tackle your project, that kind of broad visioning early in the process goes a very long way. You wanna think about how you identified this particular project or need. Did it come out of a, a public engagement process? Did VCRD do a community visit? Have you done survey work? Um, did you lose your general store and now you're kind of you know, grouping around and trying to figure out how to reopen it? Or is this a conversation that's happened between kind of a small group of people that you really need to think about how you're gonna get broad community buy-in? Um, you really wanna know how the community feels about a project. We frequently hear about groups of people who get really excited about building projects and then they go out to the community and they expect them to be equally excited about this project. And, and they hit a brick wall and they've invested time and they've invested money in getting a project to a certain point. And so you, you really wanna make sure that you're bringing the community along in the process. Um, it's a lot of community conversations um, and it's really making sure that it's, it's open communication. You're communicating what they're working on. The community has the opportunity to express concerns. Um, and I apologize in advance. Our plow guy has not come yet, and the law of the universe says he will come up the driveway and our dog will bark. So if that happens, that is why, and, and I'm sorry. Um, you want to do some information gathering kind of early in this process. A lot of buildings in our downtowns um, may have been challenges for a while. So past community members may have already reached out to the Preservation Trust of Vermont. They may, may have already done some work on this planning process. And so Look to see if you have any conditions assessment. Are there reports, architectural drawings? Is there an old feasibility study that was done? Kind of figure out what information you have, what gaps may exist, and then you have technical assistance providers who can kind of help you fill in those gaps. Um, and there's, you know, your known knowns, the things that you know you need to get done, your known unknowns, common challenges with buildings, you have to deal with code compliance, accessibility upgrades, you know that wastewater or water is an issue. Those are things that you're not quite sure, sure how you're gonna solve, but you will figure out how to solve it in this planning process. And then there's your unknown unknowns. And that's where good planning goes a long way in helping identify those in the process. There may, especially with historic buildings, there may be unseen structural issues. There may be unknown environmental issues that you're gonna have to deal with. And so the better job you do in your pre-development process to identify those things, and the better job you do kind of building a contingency into your budget, those are going to be a lot less disruptive than if you just assume you have a very clear picture of your project and you go charging full steam ahead. And so you've kind of like 
figured out the city that you're going to for your road trip. And now you need to figure out who's going to be in the car, who's coming with you. And so who needs to be involved in moving this idea forward, moving this project forward? Obviously, you're going to want to engage members of your community. You want to make sure you're engaging local officials. Um, even if it's not a municipally owned building, just letting the select board, letting the town clerk and the town administrator know what's going on, always good to kind of keep those communication channels open. Um, there's a lot of partners and technical assistance providers who can be involved in this process and who can come in pretty early. Um, funders, you need to wait until there's enough of a there there for them to understand whether or not they can be involved in the project. Technical assistance providers can come in really early and kind of help you shape the vision and help connect you with the resources to move the project forward. And so, you know, we're, we're really here as a resource and can be used early and often in this process. And then as you move along, you know, working with the reviewers, the regulatory branch, the funders, those are all people who will kind of maybe join your, your road trip later on in the process, um, but it's good to be thinking about them and how you want to engage them. You want to think about who's missing from this conversation, um, either people who aren't able to make, you know, preliminary meetings that you may have or have been traditionally left out of the conversation, you know, thinking of VCRD when they do their, their evening community visits. There's childcare and there's food. They try and kind of lower the barriers for people to be able to attend those events. If you're thinking about doing a survey, make sure you mail the survey, make sure you email the survey, make sure you leave the survey at those places where people tend to convene and communicate, whether it's the post office or the general store. People access information in lots of different ways. And, and we as kind of planners have to think about how are we going to be able to engage the most members of our community. Um, and really make sure you engage those people who you who may be challenging. Like we know that there are people in communities who have really loud voices and who may have really positive opinions or really negative opinions. And so you wanna make sure you engage, engage those movers and shakers, but also like sit down and have a cup of coffee with the person who you think may really throw up some roadblocks here because frequently they have very real concerns about the project. Sometimes those can be alleviated through conversations and sometimes they're really things that you wanna think about. Um, and so it, it's it's hard, but we really want to make sure that we're we're having conversations with everybody in the community. And then you know, as you're having these conversations, who are who's that core group of people who's going to help move this project forward? If it's a municipally owned building, you know, who's who's the commission that's going to do this? Or if it's either a, a nonprofit with a board who may have to have kind of a group that's that's coalescing around the project, or if you're in the process of forming a new board and a new nonprofit, who's gonna be that core working team? And so it's really about like this group of individuals that wants to see something amazing happen and kind of how you get from a group of individuals into this, this organization who can really have the capacity to move a project. And this is a very overwhelming part of the process because people get there's so many things to think about how do you want to structure your organization what is your project going to look like how the heck are you going to pay for it and people feel like they have to solve every problem at once and and really it's about just putting one foot in front of the other and leaning on each other and picking up on the phone when you have those moments of panic and calling your partners and like letting them offer you some encouragement and just remembering that every project started at this point at one time and everybody will hit these these hurdles and it, it's really about just kind of continuing to move it forward and building that local capacity and so like as you're forming your working group you want to think about like the structure of it and those skill sets that you want to have and so you want to have your your president or your chair the the person who can help manage productive meetings good at delegating good at motivating good at moving things forward a vice chair or VP who supports the chair in that work and can kind of fill that role if the chair is not available. Treasurer, ideally someone with good financial skills, but I would say really someone who's detail oriented um, and keep track of the numbers and, and the finance side of this. Um, and a secretary, good writer and a good communicator. Those are kind of like the basic building blocks of a board. And then in important skill sets that you either want to be cultivating in your working group or potentially looking outside and getting some professional assistance with, you know, accounting, funding, finance, legal expertise is really helpful, especially if you need to form a new nonprofit. 
Um, architecture, engineering, historic preservation. It's great to have those people involved. Um, project management, uh, marketing, communications, business planning. It's great when you have someone who has some experience with um, fundraising, grant writing, all of those things are likely to come up in your project. And so either as part of the working group or as part of kind of your, your volunteer groups that may come after, um, you want your working group that that board to have a lot of enthusiasm for the project again the road trip may be long you want them really to be invested in this you want them to have the time and the energy to invest in the project and um, you want them to have good connections and i think the, you know for vermont this is a real challenge you don't want them to already be over committed and we know that there's this like group of people in our towns who do everything and so you certainly want to have those people involved and maybe you want to have a couple of those people on your board, but you want to also want to look at this as an opportunity to kind of grow capacity. And so maybe there's a couple people in town that haven't been really involved, but, but meet have a lot of these qualities and like you really want to engage in this process. And these are kind of the responsibilities that come up of your working group. And these are the buckets that they fall into. So obviously fundraising money side of it, Community engagement, that regular communication, making sure that you have a mechanism for that, whether it's a, a newsletter or a website, social media, really want to be able to share that information as the project develops. Um, if you're going to have in kind as part of this, if there's going to be volunteer coordination, having one or two people who are really focused on that. Building rehab, like the people who are really focused on the building and what needs to happen here. And contracts and compliance is something that frequently overlaps with building rehab, but depending on the level of complexity of your funding stack, that might be a place where having some outside expertise to deal with the compliance part of it could be really helpful. Um, so you wanna think about your existing skill sets, either in, on a board, in a municipal group, or as you're pulling people together, bring on new people who are going to help fill those gaps, recognize when you need a little bit of help, and that's totally fine. There's lots of programs that can, can do that. Um, and take advantage of the capacity building resources and funding sources that exist. And I would also say, you know, leave room for people to get involved at a level that works for them. There's this idea of like, you can give a meeting, you can give a, a minute, you can give a month, give a minute meeting month, that would be the correct order. People can get involved at all different levels. And maybe somebody is able to help you write a specific grant, but they may not be able to be your treasurer. And so like leaving the door open for that involvement can be helpful. And maybe that grant writer five years from now will have the capacity to serve on your board. And so it's kind of like growing that base of support through this involvement. And we can't, can't overstate the importance of having a project champion or like a core group of people who are really going to stay on top of this project. I think a lot of times when we see these big community projects, like the ones that are successful have that project champion or that core group of people who do this and being committed to the outcome and really kind of bringing everybody along with you. Like you're the driver, you're moving this car and you just gotta stick with it. And so there are, this is one of those 101 tips. And so if you have a question, this is a, a good stopping point, we can talk about it. Um, program like programs like VHCB's Rural Economic Development Initiative, ready. Um, the USDA Technical Assistance Program, MTAP are all designed to kind of increase capacity and support projects as they look at typically federal funding sources. And so even if a grant application may feel overwhelming, if administering that grant may feel overwhelming, there may be resources available to help you tackle that. Um, the Vermont Community Foundation also has a nonprofit capacity building program, which is really designed at kind of building the capacity of your board. And so whether you're pre-existing or in the process of forming, that could be a good resource for you as well. Um, Ready is focused on communities of 5,000 or less who are looking at um, typically going after federal funding uh, or some other type of funding source and really focused on community economic development and I think um, working lands businesses. And so if you're in a community of less than 5,000, Ready may be a good fit for you, more than 5,000, and you'd have to look elsewhere. Um, the USDA technical assistance grants, frequently you'll wanna check with your regional planning commission or your regional economic development corp. Those, are, those um, entities frequently have technical assistance money and it's really focused on building the pipeline 
towards the USDA grant programs. Um, and the Municipal Technical Assistance Program, MTAP, also currently runs through the RPCs. Um, there's a, a list of pre-identified communities and, and that's available online. And I feel like we could, we could drop that in the chat. And so if you are an MTAP community, you should talk to your RPC about that. Because again, that's focused on kind of helping you prepare projects, wastewater, water, housing, economic development, kind of those, those transformational investments. And so there, there are a lot of resources out there to kind of help either in, increase capacity on a one-off situation, increase capacity of, you, of your board, and really set you up to be able to move the project forward and take advantage of all of those resources that are available. So take a quick pause and see if there's anything in the chat or any hands raised before we go on. And so you've, oh, uh, yeah, Abigail. I've got Abigail. Abigail, go ahead and unmute yourself. Wow, best speech of my life. Sorry about that. Can you hear me okay? Oh, perfect. I'm a little under the weather, so I apologize. This has um, been absolutely amazing um, so far, and I really uh, thank you guys for putting this on. This is great information um, to be shared and um, a lot of different perspectives to look at stuff. Um, and having started and formed uh, groups throughout my previous career, um, one of the things I would say is um, not only leading everything in kindness, but also when you're developing stuff, you had mentioned, you know, a minute, a month, whatever people can volunteer. Um, that's really, that is very key because you don't want to put volunteers out. Um, but it's also, I think, important to be able to delegate, delegate things um, as, as to people who like learning people's interests. So somebody may only want to give a minute, but they don't realize that their skill sets are what's actually really valuable. So if you're talking about, hey, we need to do a newsletter, um, throwing it, you know, out there for ideas from others in the group to be able to have opportunities to join in is also something really helpful. So I just wanted to um, to share that as well, that my experience um, recruitment um, is, you know, having people know that their value is appreciated and that they kind of have more of a purpose than just a body there um, can really make a big difference in, in how people want to want to stick with a group. So uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Abigail. And I appreciate that. Like my perspective, I view this through one very specific lens and perspective. Like if you have experience and want to chime in, like I welcome that feedback. Um, so that that's that's great, too. Thank you. Um, we also had a question from yeah. Cynthia um, who asks, do you have do you have to go with one of these resources or can you layer the help? Um, is there a cap to how much help a project can receive? Sure. Um, so I think you certainly can layer the resources and you may end up using them differently. So I want to say MTAP, I think the, the maximum award per community is $100,000, um, whereas Ready, I think, is 7500 kind of per grant. I don't know what the cap is for... Um, the USDA technical assistance program, but I have seen a lot of projects layer them. And so maybe you end up using ready to write a grant application for the Vermont community development program, um, which has had money and that's kind of pretty complicated. You may be able to have them do an application for the Northern border regional commission, which is another funder and they may be able to recycle that. And so maybe that's how you use the ready grant. And then you use you know, the technical assistance grant to think about USDA and MTAP to do your pre-development work. And so you may be able to layer those resources and take advantage of all of them. Thanks. So we know the city we're going to, we've got the people in our car, and now you need to kind of like focus in on like, what's your final stop? Like, where are you going within this place? And so you're, you're refining your project and really kind of thinking about what your end goal is and the planning that you need to put in to be able to, to really um, understand your budget, start looking at different funding sources, figure out a fundraising plan, and then move to implementation. Um, so you really need to think about what is the resource? 
most buildings, when you look at them creatively, can meet a lot of different needs. But every now and then you have a need and you have a building that just don't align well. And so like having a clear understanding of your building, of your proposed use, and are there current limitations? So like thinking back to those those knowns and those unknowns, you know, is wastewater a limitation here? You, you can't move forward with an implementation project until you figure out how you deal with, with your basic infrastructure. And if your property isn't large enough to accommodate a system, you need to be either thinking about how you acquire an easement on an adjacent property, how you maybe do a larger community system, if you do a cluster system, like you need to be thinking about what are the limitations now that kind of prevent us from being able to move this project forward. You wanna make sure you have any ownership issues resolved if if you don't already. Um, you you wanna be making sure you kind of clear the path to make this as smooth of a planning process as possible. So really, you know, as you're thinking about these picture, big picture questions, you're going to be de defining your scope of work in your project. And I'd say the level of complexity here is, um, the level of planning is going to be dictated by the level of complexity. And so um, you may have you may fall into a couple of different camps and that will really dictate whether you need to, you know, stop at this preliminary work phase and you're good and you can kind of move on to thinking about how you're going to fund your project or how much time you really need to be spending in this pre-development phase and, and your design work. And pre-development, um, both preliminary and kind of more intensive, this is a period of information gathering. You're making decisions about the project and inadequate planning during pre-development can lead to significant cost overruns. And so, we're inclined to just want to move ahead to the project, but investing money and time in good planning will make sure that you have a really sustainable project when you get to the implementation phase. Um, so there are two covered bridges. One of they both look pretty rough. One of them may need a little bit of um, some new sideboards, some new floorboards, and a new roof. But overall, an engineer has come in. The, the, the abutments are sound, the substructure sound, the bridge is in pretty good shape. You need a new roof and you need a little cosmetic work. $200,000, great. You're moving forward with that. You can have some pretty basic design work done. You can identify some funding sources. You can do some community fundraising. And, and for the most part, that, that is your project. But if you have the engineer come in and the abutments need to be replaced, and the substructure needs to be replaced, and the roof needs to be replaced, and structural work needs to happen, that may cost $2 million. And that is okay, but in having the group and having the community kind of go into this process with a clear understanding of what the project's gonna look like and have a basic understanding of the budget, you're gonna tackle a $200,000 and a $2 million project very differently. And so that early preliminary work, that that basic assessment um, done by a timber framer can really help direct which way your project's going to go. And Preservation Trust of Vermont, we have a small planning grant program. It's the Robert Sensor Bow Fund. And we do preliminary assessments, building assessments, um, engineering assessments to really kind of help groups get a general understanding of the needs of a building. And I think that that's a really important first step, especially if you're kind of going into this as a new group or this is a relatively new building to you, you wanna have that basic foundation. Um, if you really need to have a, a more in-depth design work done, you know, there are funding sources that can help pay for that. There are timelines associated with those funding sources and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But again, it's this is an information gathering um, point in your project and you really wanna make sure you do your due diligence here to help have a smooth planning and implementation process. And so design work kind of falls into three phases. So there's the schematic design phase. So documenting existing conditions, summarizing constraints, developing um, plans and alternatives. So maybe there's three different ways that you can redesign your town hall to meet current needs. And so figuring out what those look like, how much each of those options costs, which one works best, um, and then selecting a preferred option or if you have a lot of options, maybe one or two preferred options, 
and kind of moving into the design development phase where you're determining your major systems. You're really getting a clear understanding of, of your engineering needs, of your um, MEP, your fire suppression. You're refining your costs to have a pretty clear sense of what your budget's gonna look like. And I would say it's this schematic and design, schematic design phase and the design development phase. Like this is a good point to be involving your technical assistance providers and having conversations with potential funders. Because once you're figuring out, you know, what the project will look like, who your users are going to be, what your costs are going to be, that's a good point to engage them. Because when you reach the construction documents phase and you're finalizing everything, you don't want to then go through the regulatory process and have to go back and redo those construction documents. Um, or if you're doing a community engagement process, you don't want to have your fully baked drawings that you then take out to the community because if they have concerns about something, you want to be able to kind of go back and address them and do that with having to completely scrap the time and the money that you've put into this construction document phase. Um, and so I, I always think it's a good idea, you know, you, again, you, you can't engage funders too, too early in the process. They need to know whether or not you're a good fit for their funding source, but like talk to your, preserva your preservation trust, your other technical assistance providers to kind of bring people to the table so you can talk to them about your project and figure out what the best fits are for you. You know, uh, the best example I have, um, Preservation Trust of Vermont, we administer the Brune Revitalization Grant Program. When we're doing a regulatory process, we can engage the Park Service at 50%, which is um, too early for them to make final determinations, but they can see the basic outline of the project and let us know if they see any red flags. And then we typically submit the drawings between 65 and 75% because the Park Service can complete their review, the state can complete their review, and then any um, regulatory requirements can be incorporated into those construction documents. And so just not getting too far ahead in the process and engaging the partners at the right points. And once you get to that design development phase, you've got a pretty firm budget number. And we know that those have shifted a lot in the past few years because of fluctuating costs. And that's where having that really good contingency comes into play. Um, but your, your total project budget is gonna contain a few different types of costs. So your soft costs, your, your architectural engineering, the people and the things that are gonna make the project move forward going to have hard costs, which are your construction costs, and then your contingency. And so that's your total project budget. And some of those things may be grant eligible. Some of those things may be a better fit for fundraising. And this is where um, a professional who has a lot of experience with kind of project funding stacks, grant management can help you figure out how to plug potential funding sources and funding into these different expenses how um, how to make everything align and run smoothly as you start looking at funding sources and how to actually get the money out the door and get the project moving. When you're thinking about grants, we all get really excited when we hear about grants. You wanna make sure you understand the short and long-term long obligations associated with funding sources. Um, with the exception of really private fundraising where you're accountable to your donors, private fundraising is like your most flexible money. Um, if you start looking at grant programs, whether foundation, state, federal, all of them are going to have strings, we'll call them strings that come along with it. And so like having a very clear understanding of what those strings are and going into it with the understanding that you need to, you need to work with the funders on that. You know, I think all of us wish that we got to make the rules and we could make it as easy as possible on all of the projects that apply for funding, but, but really we're required to follow the the programs that we administer and the federal funding, I mean, they, they, they come from their laws that we have to follow. And so I think funders try and be as helpful as they can, but really like we, there has to be very clear conversations as you're thinking about funding sources, about what is a good fit for your project and, and your level and comfort with kind of regulation. Um, what are the administrative costs with associated with grant funds? And thinking about putting a lot of those grant funds together you know, the East Callis General Store, um, which is a project that just kind of wrapped up this fall. I think that ended up being maybe about $2.5 million. And they had 18 different funding sources in that stack. And 
it it worked but the administrative side of this the human power to make that happen they had amazing professionals to help them but that's a really complicated funding stack and so i think you want to be very strategic about thinking about funding sources that are a good fit for your project and your goals and your uses but also um thinking about how you're going to manage that administrative burden how you're going to work with all of those different requirements and so these are kind of your your funding buckets and this does not include fundraising we'll touch on that after so state and federal grant programs tax credits um state tax credits historic um, federal tax credits new market tax credits LIHTC, uh, low-income housing tax credits lots of different tax credits um the ones that we see applied most frequently are the downtown and village center tax credits. So if your project is located in a designated downtown and village center, um, there are tax credits that I think range from 25 to 50% of your total project costs with caps that help with accessibility, fire suppression, facade improvements. And um, Caitlin Corkins, who is the grant and tax credit administrator with the Division of Historic Preservation in the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, she administers that program. Oh, and there's also tax credits for um, flood mitigation and res resiliency. And so that's a, a great resource to look at. And I think we're just wrapping up a, a bonus round of tax credits specifically re related to flood mitigation, but the tax credit deadline is usually July 1st and that happens every year. And so that's, that's a great resource for a lot of community projects. Municipally owned buildings are not eligible for tax credits. Um, there's traditional financing, so so debt service, and then there's foundation grants, um, which I think foundations frequently give to projects they have relationships with. So foundations that are local or statewide and are familiar with you and familiar with your project, but you know there are national foundations that have ties to Vermont as well, and so there's a, a pretty broad landscape. Um, and so really having a firm understanding of of what your project budget is how much you think you may be able to raise from the community and what you think you can get from grants. Um, you wanna work with partners to compile a list of all of your potential funding options, understand kind of what the, the grant award amounts are. Just because the maximum award is $500,000 doesn't mean every project gets $500,000. And so doing a little homework and looking at kind of what the funders have funded and at what amount can be really, it's, it's good to do a little bit of investigating um, looking at the regulatory requirements, long-term stewardship obligations, reporting requirements, those it's all a balancing act of figuring out what's the best fit for your project. And again, like invest the time in the sources that are most likely to yield positive results. I some projects just like want to put in an application because they you never know, like maybe we'll get some money. But if you're not a good fit for the funding source or, or you're not eligible, don't put in an application because it's a lot of work for you to pull all of that information together. And it's a lot of work for the reviewers who, who may have 50 or 60 applications to review. And it's so disappointing when you really like a project, but they're, they're just not eligible or they're just not a good fit based on the parameters. And so a lot of that can be solved with like a phone call before you start investing a lot of time in a grant application. Um, and most of these programs, especially in Vermont, there's a person on the other end of that phone. And so like they're here to help and, and they want to help. And so really like call them. Um, or if you're nervous about calling them, call us and then we can call them and we can introduce you so you feel a little bit better about that. And you want to make sure you socialize your project with partners, donors, funders before you start submitting those applications or making those asks. You don't want a funder to see your project for the first time as part of the application review. You wanna to talk to them, you wanna attend a workshop, you wanna to talk to PTV about doing a funders meeting. You wanna be able to get feedback and make improvements because all of the funding sources that you will look at for community development projects are very competitive and everything you can do to make your project, um, refine your project and get it to a point where it's going to be its most competitive. You wanna be able to do that. And, and those opportunities are out there. It, it just takes a little bit of kind of legwork in advance of the grant application. And like we've touched on these, but I just like to reiterate them, like federal funding considerations, um, the National Historic Preservation Act and the National Environment 
Environmental Policy Act are two separate laws that federal agencies are required to follow. They have to stop, look, and listen before making decisions that impact historic properties and the human environment. Every federal funding source is required to um, complete these reviews, the Section 106 review, the environmental review for NEPA. Um, most federal funding sources will require their own reviews. So if you have five federal funding sources in your stack, you may end up doing three or four reviews. Um, and the timing of those reviews may look different depending on your funding source. So again, like lean on the people who administer the program, talk to them about the requirements, discuss the review process, how long it's going to take, when it needs to happen, if there's a shelf life to any of the components of the review. Um, those are really, those are important questions that you can ask in advance. And, and hopefully like this kind of flag in the presentation will, will kind of jog something in your memory as you're looking at funding sources and being like, oh, I want to make sure I ask this question about does the review take three weeks or does it take three months? Um, there's going to be quarterly and annual reporting with any federal funding source. And frequently you have to do reporting a couple years after you close the grant. If there are Davis-Bacon wage requirements, that's a whole other layer of reporting that has to happen during the grant. Um, most federal funding will have some kind of notice of interest or easement that goes on as a protection of the investment of public money. And again, all, all of this will be laid out in the grant manual and will be covered in a workshop, but just like make sure to ask the questions because as a funder, you want people to understand the obligations up front. And so like, I really love when people ask questions about these things. So, so don't be nervous about it. It's always better to ask the question. And coordination of multiple reviews is really important. You're probably gonna have to do multiples, but you can help smooth the process. And I think either getting all of your reviewers either on a Zoom call or ideally in a room together to kind of talk through what needs to happen when, if anyone can piggyback on other reviews, like for people with programs and like, we wanna make this as painless as possible for the projects while also meeting the requirements. And usually there's a way to do that and kind of integrate reviews. But again, getting people together, that's how you're gonna make that happen a little easier. So we'll, we'll stop here. We've kind of had a long stretch. So like, we'll stop here and see if there are any questions. I have had a couple people ask if the slides will be available and just a reminder to everybody that the full recording will be available. So the slides will be available with Jenna talking about all the things she knows. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Jenna, do you want to, we sure. could talk later about um, making the slides available as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great. Any other questions? I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but I see Abigail Pelton yeah. has a question. And I got the mute button this time. <laughs> um, thank you again. This is just wonderful uh, information. And I, I wanted to be really um, transparent about kind of what I had mentioned earlier. Um, hearing this and knowing people are going, you know, this is project learning. Um, if people are looking at a project and feel that they are going to, you know, that a nonprofit may be the avenue because of opportunities to help support one particular project as well as maybe those down the road, um, to be aware all of this information is like relevant, I, I would just remind people it would be two separate projects. So you'd want to focus the same information on the development of your nonprofit as well as maybe the particular project. And if you're working with a team, recognizing the everyone's values and re, and their availability, somebody may have a really strong um, skill set that would benefit, but they may not have the time. And you don't want to pressure people or burn people out um, if they're working on both projects. So. Um, knowing the 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 different avenues and that you know having a nonprofit may benefit, but maybe some of the people who are focused on your project um, might not want to put as much energy into the nonprofit. So just knowing that those are two separate things, and that all of this information is just amazing and helpful to both. So thank you again for putting this on. Yeah, and Abigail, that's a that's a good reminder that um, especially if you're kind of in this. Um, if your group is forming around the same time that you're kind of designing this project, and, and this is really relevant um, a lot with community trusts that we see organizing around kind of the, the closure and reopening of a general store where the group is both navigating 
becoming a nonprofit with kind of pulling together a project. And these two things happen on parallel tracks. And there is a lot of overlap, but I, I agree with you, Abigail, that like being able to focus energy on the formation of the organization and kind of the resources that are available for that can complement the, the project development work. But um, we could have a whole nother lengthy conversation around kind of the the formation of a nonprofit and kind of what goes into that. But I would say that like, if you're in that process, reach out to someone like the Preservation Trust of Vermont, we have um, financial resources that kind of can help community groups navigate that. So if you need legal assistance, if you need examples of bylaws, those types of things, like um, we can certainly be a resource for that. And if, if we don't have that information, we can connect you with partners too. So it's a great point. Um, is there time for one more question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Amy Tudor is asking, um, how do tax credits help or how do they work? Um, yeah, maybe you could just say a little more about that. Sure. So for the for the state level credits, um, again, municipal projects aren't eligible. So if you're a, a privately owned property, you will have taxes that the credits can offset. But for nonprofits that don't typically pay taxes, the credits can be um, they're transferable credits, so you can sell them to a bank or, a, or an insurance company, and they frequently will buy the credits for 85, 90, 95 cents on the dollar. And so you can, um, especially if you're working with a bank, if you have a $50,000 credit, they will buy that credit and you can use it as collateral maybe for like financing part of your construction. And so it's it's the sale of those state level credits that makes them beneficial. When you start getting into um, federal historic tax credits, new market tax credits, low income housing tax credits, those have to be syndicated, which is a much more complicated process. And you, um, you have to have a large enough project that the amount of credits generated is worth um, the costs associated with syndication. So for example, like new market tax credits, which tend to be in the millions of dollars of you know, tax credit value, syndication usually costs like $500,000 per project. So like you have to have a big enough project where there's value in that, but um, real estate development finance professionals can help you with that. And again, Caitlin Corkins manages both the state and the federal historic tax credit. So she can be a good resource in terms of that one. Um, so state tax credits are pretty easy to navigate. Federal tax credits, new market, LIHTC, you want to make sure you have a, a professional there to help guide you with that. And could you say a little more about when you when somebody is looking for um, somebody to help them manage the funding and stack their funding, um, how do they find a guru? How do they find yeah. somebody who's really specializing in that? So um, you can find some professionals through like the, the Rural Economic Development Initiative, Ready. They can sometimes help you with those professionals. You know, talk to your, your regional planning commissions. They may have some support that they can offer in terms of navigating those more complicated sources. You can also like talk to your community members. You never know who's living in town and like who has experience navigating these programs. Um, and, and really who you might be able to help grow in that process. So maybe someone has some experience with like some funding sources, but not others, but they, they're good and they're detail oriented and they can kind of navigate that and kind of get some professional experience in the process. Um, there's, there's kind of these pool, this pool of kind of professional consultants and owners reps and, and people who can help you navigate that. So I would say it's really going to be project dependent because some people are really good with different funding sources, but like Ready is a good resource. You could give us a call. We, you know, we can help you find some of those people because it is this like very specialized skill set <laughs> with a lot of spreadsheets. <laughs> Wait, I think that's it for now. Thanks. So we're going to do like 90 seconds on fundraising and like this is not an overview a comprehensive overview of fundraising but like it's just really important to think about fundraising as an important piece of that funding stack because almost every project will need to do some form of fundraising whether it's small through a friends group or whether it's a hundreds of thousands of dollars capital campaign um i think people get very nervous about fundraising and they assume that you can fund a project through grants and grants can cover a big chunk of your project, but I'd say probably like 50% or more is going to come from 
from private fundraising or or municipal dollars. Um, and so you, you need to be thinking about it and like thinking of that working group having having a brain trust of people who are thinking about the fundraising side of it. Um, and when we have to raise money, we're like, okay, well, we're, we're going to send out an appeal and we're going to see what comes back. We're going to do a crowdfunding um, thing. And, and fundraising, fundraising is a very personal thing. And when you're doing kind of a larger capital campaign, you're going to get 40 to 70% of your donations from a very small group of major donors. And so that's kind of like your quiet phase of okay, we have to raise $500,000. Really, you want to raise 250000 of that before you go public with your campaign. You want to be having those conversations with the people who really have the capacity to give a lot to your project. And everybody's like, there's no one in town who can give that much money or no, you know, we can't, we can't raise that much money in our, in our town. And I will say that like, communities can do amazing things and you will be amazed at the people who he either have roots in your community or live in her, your community and, and really want to be part of something bigger and your middle and your major donors are really those are those people and so you're going to get a, a small number of large gifts your middle donors depending on the size of your project you're probably looking at kind of your five ten fifteen twenty five thousand dollar gifts those are your middle donors, you'll get a medium amount of those. And then you're going to get lots of smaller donations, your grassroots donors. But those are really, that's your friend raising. And it may not make up a huge slice of your actual fundraising dollars. But like, especially when you're thinking about a nonprofit and kind of developing sustainable giving, like your grassroots donors, some of them will move up to be your middle donors, your middle donors, a few of them will move up to be your major donors. And so like, it's relationship building, it's communicating, it's kind of cultivating those donors and, and keeping them up to date and letting them be part of this really amazing project. So I would just say like, and again, private fundraising is flexible money. You can use it to fill gaps. It can be used as match, it can be used when you have that contingency that you really need to cover. Um, it can be used to fund pieces of the project that either aren't grant eligible or aren't overly competitive. And so like, I know people shy away from fundraising, but like, it's really important to think about PTV does a fundraising retreat every year. We have fundraising consultants who we can connect with people. I think fundraising planning can sometimes fit into some of those other programs. So just like know that you may have to deal with it and that if you're going to deal with it, you, you do need to be kind of strategic about it and don't just automatically resort to a big sale or a mailer. Those things are amazing too, but you want those to come in at the end. And like the thermometer out in front of your building is amazing make sure the thermometer is most of the way full before you put it out because there's nothing sadder than driving by a building for three years and like watching that thermometer just like incrementally move up. So like go public with it, but like feel confident that you can fill that thermometer. And you wanna have a plan for either early fundraising or securing seed money because almost every early part of this process, this planning process is gonna cost money most planning grants require a match, um, consultants may require a match. And so whether it's a small group of committed funders or having the municipality create a seed fund through you know a couple thousand dollars every year, you need to have a pot of money to start with. And so um, thinking about that as you're kind of formulating that group, you're building that board. And if you are in the process of organizing a nonprofit, but you are not a 501c3 yet, you could look at something like a fiscal sponsor. So PTV sometimes acts as a fiscal sponsor for groups that are in the process of becoming a 501c3. And so it lets them start taking donations before they actually have their status from the IRS, but it's in process. Um, so that's just an, another another layer to add to this. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Tina um, asks, can you speak a bit about corporate donors and the pros and cons of going after that kind of money? Sure. Um, corporate donations. I, I see corporate donations play a bigger role, I think, in programs um, like PTV, for instance, like we do a lot of um, business sponsorships related to our conferences and our, our programs, but we don't see them play as large of a role in kind of construction projects. And I would just say like, if you're interested in that, make sure to do your research in terms of what they fund. So taking a look at their eligibility requirements, what they funded in the past, and just being conscious of like, are there gonna be expectations that come with that money? Just like the regulatory side of things, like 
is a corporation going to feel like they have some some ownership? They're obviously invested in this project, but like, what what does that mean in terms of your project goals and the long term expectations? And so I would say, like, just just think about it and go in with eyes eyes wide open and ask a lot of questions. So procurement. Um, I, I mentioned like understand all the procurement requirements before um, you sign a grant agreement, understand all the grant requirements. Like procurement is an important piece of this, but like understand the requirements before you sign a piece of paper. And and frequently, and, and I do this as well, like if you're designing a grant program, usually there's somewhere in there that says like, I understand and acknowledge the obligations here that like it's in the grant agreement, read the grant agreement, ask questions before you sign it. Because like once you sign it, you're in it and you really don't want to have to go through the process of unraveling it. Funders want to fund your project. You want the money. You just want to make sure it's a good match. Um, but procurement in terms of like securing the contractors to do the work, understanding the expectations associated with the funding sources is really important. Is there a competitive bidding process that's required? What does that look like depending on the size of your project? Um, with federal funding, there seems to be a pretty consistent break at $250,000. So contracts that are below $250,000 follow one procurement process, contracts over $250,000 kind of a follow a heavier process. And just so like understanding what the requirements are, how many bids do you need? Does Davis-Bacon wages apply? Does Build America, Buy America apply? And, and I would say the answer to that is going to be yes, as we kind of like move forward from the implementation of that. There was a, a grace period where it didn't always apply, but I think it will apply to a lot more projects moving forward. And how does um, bidding impact the project timeline? So if you need to do a public closed bidding process, how long do the bids need to be posted? When can you open them? How long is that process going to take? It may not be as simple as making three calls and selecting a contractor and having them start on Monday. And so knowing what that procurement process means for your timeline and if there's costs associated with it, um, you know, again, just like understanding how all of this impacts your project and the project timeline and like talk to the funders about this. Um, again, communication is a huge part of it. And this is another area like thinking of the working group in the buckets, contracts and compliance, like having a professional help you navigate this piece, whether it's a professional through ready or you know, somebody that you're you're funding from some of that private fundraising, that that's really important money. You want to make sure you administer the funds well, that you're following all of their requirements. It's better to spend a little bit of money up front on a professional who can help you with it than try and unwind the mess of, of not administering the funds correctly. Um, and make sure that any regulatory requirements are included in your bid documents and your contracts. And so again, thinking of the environmental review process is the section 106 process. If there are requirements, so if you have to do work a certain way, if you have to do a certain type of material, if you're required to do archeology, span make sure that's in your bid documents and your contracts. They need to be, contractors need to be aware of those expectations and, and it may impact the, the price of that or contractors may try and get away with not following those requirements, but putting in a lower bid, but boy, is it a mess if, you get to the other side of it and the work isn't done the way it was supposed to be done. And so just like, again, being consistent and including language across the board, the funders provide it to you so you have it and just make sure it's copied over. And some programs will ask to see your bid documents and your contracts. And that's usually why, just to make sure that they know that the right language is included there. That was a very close 101 tip. So I'm not sure we'll have any other questions, but maybe. And always have a contract. I know that sounds crazy, but like always sign a contract, even for small projects, even with contractors that you know, have everybody needs to sign something. Um, so your budget, kind of your your budget buckets again, your pre-development, your your planning. There are funding sources that support that. They're usually specific to pre-development. And again, they're limited. And I would say their their timing can really impact a project. If you go into a project and plan on applying to USDA for, you know, um, I think it's RDBG funding to help with pre-development, or if you want to go through the Vermont Community Development Program, which is a HUD program, 
they have a planning grant, but like there's a process associated with that pre-development money that you need to fulfill before you move on to your construction process. And so just like budgeting for that in terms of time and money um, and complex projects can cost a hundred thousand dollars or more for pre-development for your engineering your architecture, your environmental reviews. And so like, you want to make sure that you're budgeting for that and that you're including it in your your fundraising goals, your total project costs, and your, your grant proposals. For implementation for the actual construction projects, most grant programs are reimbursement programs. So you have to spend the money, submit invoices or documentations, and then you'll be reimbursed either based on the percentage of your expenses or your project progress or whatever the structure of your individual grant program is. And so you have to have money to pay the contractor and then get reimbursed. Um, project uh, tax credits are frequently paid out upon project completion. And so again, having either someone as part of your working group or someone that you're hiring, understanding the payment schedule and determining if you need bridge financing. So if you need a construction loan or something to help you cover all of those costs and make sure that you have enough money to flow in between each reimbursement. Um, and I will say, you know, especially when dealing with something like a, a federal reimbursement, it can, it can be a couple weeks or it may be 90 days, depending on kind of like what the process is. And then when you factor in things like government shutdowns and everything else, like there's there's there can be a lot of uncertainty in between that period between submitting those expenses and getting that money. And so really thinking about how you're going to pay for things, um, that's that's an important piece of the conversation. And knowing that grants are primarily reimbursement, I feel like that's one of the biggest surprises for people when they're new to the funding world. And like that's that's key. Um and just keeping track of your expenses. So like if you're if you're doing in-kind donation as part of your matching funds, you need to you need to make sure you're logging those volunteer hours. You need to make sure you're having people signing in and signing out and keeping good documentation with all of that. Better to have more paperwork than find out that you didn't track something properly. Um, you can probably tell what type of personality I have based on kind of how I approach all of this, but um, you want to keep track of which programs have like maximums. Some programs, say you have a $100,000 um, project, $80,000 of that can be federal funding, but you need to have a 20% match that comes from either private fundraising, state dollars, um, municipal dollars. And so like, again, understanding how all of those pieces together, making sure you're tracking expenses and drawing things correctly. And then making sure that you're keeping your organizational expenses and your project expenses separate and then the other layer to that is like when you're thinking about fundraising, there's fundraising for capital projects for your project. And then there's your annual fundraising, your membership, everything else that kind of has to keep running at the same time that you're managing the project. And so kind of all of, like Abigail mentioned, those multiple pieces, the organization and the project, everything kind of has to keep moving forward together. When you get to construction, when you get to shovels in the ground, you want to double check that all of your regulatory and permitting requirements are approved. Just like take the time to make sure you're good to go. You want to have a clear payment and draw schedule that aligns with the purposes and percentages of your funding. You want to have a calendar of your reporting requirements. You want to keep track of those and you want to keep track of change orders. Some programs will require you to submit change orders as part of your reporting. Um, you want to make, make sure you have kind of a project person who's available to answer questions and ideally is available during the day for construction management to be on site, being available to be able to answer questions in the moment is so much easier than having to stop something to find the person to answer the question. And in the realm of construction where like time is money, you want to have someone available who can really kind of like be on top of that construction process and be your point person. And so whether that's hiring an owner's rep, whether that's someone on your board who has good experience and can do that, like figuring out who your point person will be during this process. And, and, and it, this again, maybe another place for like, maybe your general contractor is gonna do that for you, but just like figuring out who that person is. Um, and make sure that you inform funders of substantial changes. You don't need to tell me every time you find a nail, but like you need to let funders know when something happens, like thinking of those change orders, because 
the, the funder and the regulatory process has approved a certain project. And so if you have to pivot, we can frequently pivot with you, but we need to know that as it's happening. And so just like, again, communication is such an important part of any project management strategy. And these are kind of like your don't forgets, but they're all important during the implementation project. Um, so like as you're moving forward, funders frequently have um, credit that needs to either be in written form, a logo that needs to be on a sign, make sure you have that available um, and make sure you're including it where you need to. You really wanna make sure you're communicating the project as it's happening, keep people up to date. People are gonna be really excited when this happens, especially if this has been a project that's been a long time coming for a community. Like people, people wanna know it's happening. Make sure you say thank you. You can never say thank you too many times to people, but people will remember when you don't say thank you. They will remember when you don't send a, an acknowledgement. Um, be appreciative, lead with kindness. Everybody wants to, to be involved and have their, their time, their donations, their skills valued. Thank your board. Like it's a huge amount of work for them to like thank them. Make sure you take lots of photos along the way. And if you're taking photos, if there's people in them and they need to sign giving you permission to use those photos, just do it in the moment. If you need to sign to give those photos over to a funder, do it in the moment. There's nothing worse than getting to the grant closeout and having to go back and find all of these signature forms. So just like keep on top of photograph or any other release forms as you're kind of moving through the project. Again, having like someone on your working group who's really detail oriented and gonna keep track of this stuff for you. And celebrate. Celebrate when you complete a phase, celebrate when you, celebrate for anything really. Like these are, it's a lot of work to, to get these projects and you need to stop and enjoy the successes um, because if you don't, it's just, it can be a really long slog. And so make sure to enjoy the moment, enjoy the ribbon cutting, really be present for that. Um, and just know that like, we all as technical assistance providers and funders are, are here to support you, but you do the hard work. Like you show up every day, you make the decisions, you raise the money, you do the project. Like in many ways, we have the fun part of the job of just being your cheerleaders, but like you do an enormous amount of work as project proponents and community leaders to make these projects happen. And so, so make sure you celebrate that hard work. And if you take nothing else away from any of this, like we mean it when we say we're here to help. Like call us, ask us questions. Well, we love to come out for site visits. And I don't just mean PTV. We're so fortunate in Vermont, our, you know, USDA, our state agencies, everybody's really available and we really love working together. And it's not uncommon when you come to a preservation retreat to have someone from USDA, a couple people from the state there. Like we, we really enjoy being able to work with you all on these projects. So like, please reach out whenever you feel stuck. We're, we're, we're here to help. And the RPCs, the Regional Economic Development Corps, all of us, like that's our job and we love to do it. So that's the end of the formal presentation. And, and here's my contact information. Um, but I'll, I think I'll end the show and then we can do general questions. And I'm also happy to stay on. I'm free till 1130 to talk about project specific questions once we get to um, once we get through all the general ones. So thank you. Great, great audience. Great questions. Thanks, Jenna. Um, yeah, that was great. We have a few last um, helpful questions. Um, let's see, you're still sharing your screen. Oh, oh sorry I about that. No, that's okay. Um, all right, here we go. <laughs> Back to, we can fully see you and we can see each other, great. Um, so let's see, we had a question from Sherry um, uh, asking, what tools do you recommend for tracking all those things you were saying, you know, the budget, the contracts mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff? Um, there are, Excel can be a really useful tool in terms of kind of, building your project budget and assigning values to everything and kind of looking out um, at all of those expenses in your draw schedule. Um, 
you know, depending on the level of complexity within your organization, you may have some project management tracking software that you would want to look at. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, of checklists um, and kind of shared folders too, but I, I think a, a well-formulated Excel sheet can, can go a really long way. Um, I feel like some of the, the professionals who do this work, like the, the level of complexity on their spreadsheets is, is out of this world. So you can do a lot with that tool. Yeah. Yeah, we use spreadsheets all the time on yeah. CRD, <laughs> our, probably our main tool. tool. Um, and yes, for those who um, just joined recently, yes, the recording will be available publicly and we will email it to you directly so you won't have trouble finding it. Um, and then we had a couple suggestions. Elizabeth suggested um, that for folks to not just um, budget out for the project, but also for years one, two, and three of their operating costs, if it's gonna be a longer term project or program, um, because that's a great way to make sure that your project is sustainable. So thanks for that suggestion, Elizabeth. And we also had a suggestion from Jeff, um, use media, social media, and probably also print, yeah, newspapers, local TV, VPR, et cetera, to trumpet your cause from beginning to end. Yes, well said, Jeff, thank you. And anybody wanna raise their hand and ask a question? Jeff also offered another suggestion, which was to use um, artificial intelligence engines to, he says it's been helpful for him, um, research, implementation, even drafting PR, press releases and the like, yeah. And Alyssa is dropping her contact info in the chat and um, you'll get an email from me. You're welcome to email me directly and we'll also follow up with Jenna's contact info as well in that email. So yeah, you will have all that info from us. Amy Tudor, did you have your hand raised? Yes, hi, could I ask a specific question? I'm good with that. I feel like we've <laughs> covered most of the general ones, yeah. Yeah, we've covered most of the general. So I have I have this problem with projects where I take everything on the website so literally that I think nothing applies to me. So <laughs> we have a um, author illustrator house here in Southern Vermont. Tasha Tudor was a Vermont illustrator. And currently her house needs a lot of work. Um, it's not really like a community resource. You know, it's not like a general store. It's in residential zoning. So that's something maybe it's a follow up conversation with how do you preserve this Vermont heritage that everyone that doesn't live in Vermont wants to come see. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it, you yeah. know, it's privately owned currently. Um, there is a sister nonprofit organization. So it's sort of like this, I guess this is in the pre pre planning stages of how do you preserve this cultural landmark? Yeah, and I think I mean, and we can kind of follow up afterwards, but you, you touch on kind of important points about like, ownership is really important in terms of figuring out what those resources are. It is exponentially more challenging to find sources that are available to privately owned resources, though you can sometimes find funding sources that can work with you through through partnerships. So if there is this kind of sister nonprofit that can work to, to support this building. Um, and I'd say like something that's either culturally significant or um, significant from a preservation perspective, but maybe doesn't check the boxes of a, a grand community development project. There might be smaller funding sources, kind of um, more focused sources on kind of the, the architectural values or the cultural values. They're not gonna be your um, big federal funding sources. They may be foundations and, and smaller resources, but we could, we could follow up afterwards and kind of talk specifics. Great, thank you. I learned a lot, thank you. <laughs> Um, somebody asked about transferring a, a municipal building to a nonprofit for a dollar to be for the nonprofit to be able to access tax credits. Um, you certainly can transfer property from a non a municipality to a nonprofit. I would say like funding can play a role in that, but many funding sources are available to municipalities 
and nonprofits. I think tax credits are probably the one that that really isn't. Um, and so it's a much bigger conversation than whether or not you'll be able to access $75,000 worth of tax credits. Um, it may make sense to transfer that building from, mis from municipal ownership to a, a nonprofit, a community trust, whoever it may be. They may be the entity that's better positioned to be able to move the project forward. Um, but I, I always think it's a good idea to kind of look at it holistically and not be driven by one or two funding sources. Any further questions? Yeah, Abigail Pelton. I have to get going. So I just wanted to thank everyone. Um, this was wonderful, very informative information. And I hope um, everyone uh, shares this with, with folks because um, I would have loved to have had this before I I went down many journeys. So uh, great job to you guys. And, and thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Thanks, Abigail. Yeah, absolutely. And I've heard a lot of people echoing in the chat how informative and useful this was. So um, well, we've got one more question in the chat and um, let's answer that and then maybe we'll sign off. Um, Patty says, can you recommend a strategy for a municipal group or nonprofit to acquire a property when competing with cash buyers investors, um, having funds available in advance perhaps? I think this is kind of the value of having um, the community organization ready to go as opposed to having to be responsive. Um, so like having a community trust in a community, even though you may not have a building yet because you never went know when that general store may become available. Um, I do think part of it is having funds available in advance, but I would also say like, it's again, it's that relationship aspect that you, you having conversations with the owner what are their intentions? I mean, if if they're in this and are community minded, I would hope that you could come up with an, an option agreement that works for your needs. Um, if they're in it to sell a property and get the most amount of money for it, then you know a pretty robust fundraising effort and a quick turnaround would be really important. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it will come down to to seller motivation, fortunately or unfortunately. But having, I think, having that that um, that entity to be able to kind of funnel that energy through is really is is an important piece of it. Because like groups that are ready to be responsive when these opportunities come up, I think can react a lot more quickly than groups that have to then pull themselves together, figure out how the heck they're going to raise the money, how they're going to do it, and then respond. Um, so some community discussion in advance of like, who's who's the people here that will drive things forward as they become available? Great. And Melissa, I think you had another point to add. Yeah, if anyone doesn't have questions, I just, you know, in addition to thanking Jenna, wanted to emphasize the awesome road trip analogy and just say that, like, in addition to everything we've covered here about how it might be like long and complicated and, we, you know, you can just see the expertise Jenna brings around compliance and regulations that like road trips are also awesome. And at least personally, I want to go on more road trips in my life. We have a beautiful and incredible state to do it. So like really extending that analogy to just say, Although it's complicated and takes a lot of planning, it's really worth it. And so in addition to all of the takeaways from today, I just want to say it's so inspiring to see the projects that we have happen across the state. And it's because of um, folks, you know, taking this expertise and really using it. So again, just thank you to you all for being here and to Jenna for sharing that expertise on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks all for joining us. And again, don't hesitate to reach out to Alyssa, myself, or Jenna afterwards. We will be following up with an email with all of this good information. And yeah, thank you so much, Jenna. We really appreciate thank your you. expertise. My pleasure. Happy to do it and look forward to connecting with many of you and learning more about your projects. Thank you all. Take care. Be safe out there.